actually hurt. No, I think she is. Yeah, she's Ouch. hurt. She took a hard fall off there. Go oh, ahead. Gosh, I hope she's okay. All right, welcome in. It's the uh, Daily Puck Drop here at PuckSports.com, wherever you're watching or listening, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Music, PuckSports.com, Daily Puck Drop, the DPD. We do it every morning at 10 a.m. We release it for you, covering the top stories of uh, last night and then looking ahead to today. If you're watching, you see his smiling face. If you are listening, you don't know yet who our very, very special guest is. He's enjoying retirement. He's picked up cooking. He's a new basket weaver, probably. Uh, he's a probably a four or five handicap now on the golf course. He's running marathons every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, the Daily Puck Trump welcomes former Seattle Times calling this Larry Stone to the program. Larry, you look refreshed, and you are like you are enjoying retirement, my friend. Good to see you. Well, thank you. None of those things you said are true, but I am enjoying <laughs> retirement i i didn't grow a retirement beard like david letterman and john stewart but it looks like you have so yeah maybe, well maybe I've, you're always, telling us I, something. I've always had it i've always had it but yeah i i haven't gone quite full on just like let it go and and just uh you know let, well i've let myself go let's be honest but i've been letting myself go for years but uh you look great it's good to catch up with you God, I, I, I miss seeing you every day, and I miss, I miss talking to you at all these sporting events, but I'm glad that uh, you've jumped on today here on the uh, Daily Puck Drop, the DBT, or the DPD. you got to say that slow, because if you, 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 you rattle that off too fast, it will just come out wrong. Uh, God, there's lots to cover. We're going to get in the M's, little Seahawks. I think you retired at the wrong time. We're going to cover it all today uh, with Larry Stone. On the uh, on the daily puck drop, but let let's just go back. Let's let's revisit retirement. Why why did you feel that this was the the right time for you to to kind of walk away from from writing about sports? Well, I'm 66 years old for starters, and have been doing this. You don't look it. You don't look it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I actually was planning to retire the previous year, but the Mariners had that playoff run and. I really enjoyed myself and decided it was to run it back for one more one more Mariner season, which I thought was going <laughs> to maybe go a little farther than it ended up <laughs> last year. But it was just time. I, 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 my my first job was in 1979, which if you do the math, it's about it's 45 years. And then I, I wrote all four years at Cal. So really 50 years of writing about sports. It just felt like it was enough. I, I you know, knock on wood, I've got my health and everything. So I've figured it was a good time to to hit retirement and, and uh, see what else was out there in the world. You know, I, I joked earlier, what you officially stepped down. When, when was your last day at the paper? Right right around like second week of November? Yeah, it's right in the middle of November. And then all hell broke loose in the sports world. That's what I was going to say. You, yeah. you retired. And then, yeah. like, as a columnist, all of the juiciest stuff happened right after you retired. You, yeah. Pete Carroll gets uh, gets fired. Right. Or they parted ways, whatever your quality. He got fired. And then Kalen DeBoer leaves and goes to Alabama. Troy Dannon is, is the AD for, like, a month. Pat Chun's the new AD. I mean, the, you're right. The world went crazy did it did you miss it just for a little bit <laughs> say god i just wish i could go back and write a column and everything that's happened here in the last few months well i mean there was one week where on monday yeah. the huskies played for the national championship on wednesday carol was gone two days later <laughs> DeBoer was gone and two days later fish was hired that was all in one week and that's insane. Uh, yeah that was the that was the one time when well i kind of wished that I got some pangs of regret when the when the Huskies went to New Orleans. I thought, man, that would have been a great trip to, to go on and the whole national title run. And when all that broke loose, I, I part of me was saying, man, I wish I could write that. And part of me was saying, man, I'm glad I'm not writing that. I'm glad I let leaving that to somebody else. Just relax. Uh, and as time goes by, I'm finding that I, I have uh, I, I have less and less uh feelings of man i should be writing that and i'm just kind of yeah i'm falling out of the work mode and falling into retirement mode it's happening happening <laughs> gradually i'm not paying as close attention to things uh <laughs> but 
I do. Yeah, there's no question that all that stuff that's happened would have been fun to write about. Uh, we, we normally on the daily puck drop, we get you covered and 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 uh, caught up at all the top stories from uh, the previous night. We look ahead uh, to what's going to be happening today. We'll, we'll get to do all that. We're also going to kind of look back at, at Larry's career and and just to find out exactly what he truly is doing uh, right now. Let Let's touch in on you've been. I mean, your love is baseball. You love the sport. It's it's the sport you. I would assume you've covered the most. It's near and dear by to far, your heart. By far, yeah, yeah. Um, they j- and you've been here long enough. I mean, you weren't born here and were raised here, but for all intents and purposes, you raised here in, in Seattle, Washington. You you know what this fan base is like and what they've gone through, and they they went through another off season in which Mariner fans like myself they pull their hair out. And they just don't understand what's going on. And all they want is just a winner. They just want to win a damn World Series. They want to, first of all, they just want to get there. And they just want long sustained success. And so you go through, you, you know, you go through this offseason in which they don't do anything of note. Now, some of these moves they made out of necessity because of what ownership did, they're like, okay, well, that makes sense. But Larry, I, I just keep thinking back, which is so frustrating about this organization. It's so frustrating to be a Mariners fan my entire life. Like, I just, I have like, for me, I think I've picked the two worst teams at times, the M's and the Kooks, because I just, I, I, I love them to death, but then I want to, I want to rip my, my hair out and my head off watching them play like week in and week out. The uh, two years ago, right? It, it seems so long ago that these guys had just finished up that incredible series with the Astros. And you're thinking, well, it's it. This, the next step is to win the division, and then we're going to go to the World Series, and we're going to win the thing, and this whole rebuild and reimagining, it's all going to pay off. And yet, we it seems that this organization is so far from where they were after that long 18-inning game against Houston. I, I kind of went on a rant there, but, but how did we get from there to now? Yeah, well, last year, it was a disastrous off season, you know, instead of building on that momentum and the good feeling that the fan base had a bunch of, you know, good young players, likable players, the town was, was going crazy over them. And they, what do they do in the off season? They get, uh, you know, Colton Wong, AJ Pollock, Hummel, uh, and then none of the, you know, Tay Oscar was the one like legitimate player that they picked up and he had a, mixed bag of a year but they i think they really blew the the opportunity they had to take it to the next step and then this past off season was even worse (laughs) you know it started with that press conference i think that did irreparable Uh, harm not irreparable but it did major harm the it gave fans uh something to to hold on to like or to to cling to and to show as proof that they don't have the desire to win the 54 percent you know and we're doing you a favor you look at comments to any Mariner story, the Divish rights or anybody. And I guarantee you one of the first three comments will be a 54% joke. It just, it has a life of its own. And the other thing was the, the order of the off season, it started with uh, subtracting and dumping, you know, Suarez, Kelnick, Marco, uh, Evan White. So it, it gave the impression that it was a, complete it was going to be a teardown and then they did then they started building back up and actually had a pretty decent off season when you you know on paper i was high on this team going into the season and you know i picked 93 wins and i uh i still think they have a shot to be a really good team they just uh are in an inexplicable team-wide slump right now the, the pitching you the the pitching, you you go out and you have a chance to win every night, and and that's going to pay off in the long in the long haul because you know Julio, JP, Cal, Polanco, all those guys aren't going to be hovering around two hundred much longer. And I, and I think you see it in like last night's game, that first game against the Reds. You you see the potential of this offense. I mean, they scratch out with ten hits, they score nine runs where we talked about in the off season where this had the potential, at least on paper to be kind of one of their longest kind of where you stretch out their lineup. It certainly showed that last night they jumped on, they jumped on the pitcher last night, right in that first inning with, with JP and Julio and then Polanco, who a guy that you're going to depend on to have that power now hits a three run home run. So the things that we thought 
and DePoto and Hollander thought they would get out of their offense. You saw it for the first time in that first game against the Reds, which was great to see. If they can just continue, they're not going to score nine runs every night, and they're going to have ten hits. But I thought the most encouraging thing in, in your, you know, the little, the, the human fire hydrant, the pony cake, Devish asked us last night in the post game, he's great, and he was right. And, so, and asked service, you, you're more proud about the runs or, or the strikeouts. And he said, the strikeouts. I mean, they only struck out seven times last night. So their vision of what they wanted to do, and I agree with you with the constraints that were placed on them this offseason, Larry, uh, they did, I think, quite well, at least acquiring talent, guys that, that have a track record. And, and you saw it on display last night against the Reds, which was great to see. It, last night, for me, was the first time watching them this year that it felt fun. Yeah, it's been it's been boring baseball. It's been bad baseball. Uh, it validated all the people who th- who said that this team was going to be terrible. And I think there was more pessimism going into this season. I think it, you know, it was a pretty good spring training showing, and I think some people came back on board. But uh, I've rarely seen this amount of anger and disillusionment yeah. towards this team and i've seen a lot of anger and a lot of disillusionment but it sort of seemed to peak this offseason so why, yeah why do you I think it's different you. this yeah why do you why do you think it's different this offseason just because, because of expectations that were raised i think it was i think if it, 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 people feel like there's been a betrayal that the promise all along was that when the team got good they would they would put the finishing touches on it and and spend and you know, they just haven't gone into free agency uh, and made, and brought in impact players, like surefire players. You know, that doesn't always work. We have saw it with, with the Mets and the Padres, and there's a few guys now who are who are big-time free agents that people wanted the Mariners to get who have been busts. Let me look at Chris Bryant. Uh, you know, he hasn't done anything yeah. in, in Colorado. And Trevor Story gets always hurt. And, but... Uh, there's other success stories and you, you i mean how would how would marcus simeon have changed the fortune of the mariners if they'd got him a couple of years ago it, it, why do you think you know i've always in the last few years you know like jerry depoto has been a guy that has been a lightning rod i think in this town and lightning rod for many people and his comments and the trades and i think we focused all of our displeasure anger toward towards him but i think it, you know what I've always tried to articulate, and not the only one, I think there's a lot of people out there that have the same thought and opinion. You, you try to, you know, dig through his comments and where he stands and really get to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue for me has always been uh, ownership. And listen, I, I know they've had times where they have spent a lot of money and they have been in the upper echelon of payrolls, but it, it just feels like in the last, I don't know, uh, less than 10 years, five, six, seven, eight years that they, there just seems to be this unwillingness of this group since Stanton took it over, which we thought was going to be this like different regime. And I think some fans got caught up in, oh, it's a different ownership group. When you really peeled all the layers away, as, as you know, Larry, it, it really was the same group. They just shuffled people around. I mean, it's the same people that are, that are still on the board, still part of the ownership group, it's just different names at the top. No longer says Howard Lincoln. I know a lot of people had animosity towards Howard Lincoln, but, but this ownership group, why do you think they have been unwilling to really jump into the deep end when it comes to free agents? Well, they're businessmen. Um, I mean, they have had, as you pointed out, they have had times when they've spent, they've been, they've been up there at times in payroll. They, they went out and got Cano. They, you know, they, they extended, uh, Felix extended Julio, uh, there have been forays, you know, the one year they went out and got Beltre and Sexton, and regardless of how it worked out, those were huge, those were huge signings at the time. I know it's now pushing 20 years since that happened, but, um, and then I think, I honestly think that they were ready to do that. And then the RSN thing hit and they, they are taking a major financial blow with that, whether, you know, that whether you believe they could withstand it or not which i i think they still should have uh the way to 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 help your financial fortune is to build a team that people want to go see and that that wins titles and draws season ticket holders and all that so it's almost a penny wise pound foolish kind of kind of thing but i think that's an element that is undeniable in in their the 
what what's happening right now. I, I think for fans, I mean, I'll just, I'll speak for myself because I know there's probably fans out there that, that kind of feel you're probably the same way I do. I, I think if for, for us, for me, when, when I see them spend the amount of money that they spend on a, to redo a brewery across the street from them and to spend the millions of dollars that it took to redo that entire thing. When I, when I hear about all the, the, the upgrades to the stadium, in which some of the times they don't even pay for it, or they, they get an assist from the county to pay for it, and all these other things. And I think I sit back and I go, listen, the Hatback Grill and those things, they're great, and, they're, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful addition to the neighborhood. And, it's a great, and I've gone there, and it's, it's, it's perfect, and it's, it's great, and it's fun, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a nice addition. But I go, why can't we just spend that money on players? Like, why, why can't we do that? I mean, there clearly is money, but you, they tend to shift that money towards more of a, of a business side of things. And you mentioned it right there, to your answer to it. They're business people. I mean, when you operate and you own a sports team, should you be a business person or, or operate it like a, I don't want to say as a fan, but operate as someone that the number one goal is just to win a championship and do whatever you can to win said championship rather than operating it like it's a normal business layer because you know it it's not a normal business it's not i mean look at the guy in uh, san diego who's since passed away but uh he made it his mission to to spend as much as it took to get a championship team which he didn't get but uh i mean that's the ideal kind of owner i think that fans want to see and i agree i agree with you the cosmetic changes i too would rather see that go into to uh players than upgrading a suite that only the high rollers get to sit in anyway you know uh that's yeah that's right yeah it is i mean and and if there were some plans that they were going to i don't think they ended up doing it you're right the for people don't know they the the press box that larry stone used to command over at t-mobile would hold court this thing was beautiful it was massive they've now they downgraded that they made more premium seating up there like a premium club i remember there was once an idea or thought they were going to do I think at the camera wells were going to be removed down on the first base and third base side. I remember Katie Griggs giving an interview about this. I think at Forbes, they were going to make kind of the Jack uh, Nicholson suite down there, like even more high luxury than whatever the, the diamond club is right now. I just think, I think fans love all the bells and whistles of the stadium and they, and they like the, the new food and the, you know, I, I can, the, I can, the, you know, the, the cashless, you know, walking up and just grabbing your food and go and all that kind of stuff. It makes the experience of going to the ballpark even better. But at the end of the day, people are there just because they want to see a team win. And, and I think there's a distrust, and you talked about it. I think there's a, dist- a distrust with the fan base that they do not believe that this group is all in on winning. And I don't, I guess the only way you change that is win, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think there's been sort of a, a a change in uh, uh, revisionist history on people. I hear people say this team's been terrible for the last 10 years. I mean, they've won 90, 90 and 89 wins the last three years. Yeah. They've been a good ball club. Uh, that's what makes it so frustrating. I mean, the, the Arizona Diamondbacks got to the world series last year with 84 wins. That's fewer, you know, five fewer wins than the Mariners had. Uh, they've had a team that could have with under the right circumstances, gone a lot farther than than they have the last three years um but it's the refusal or the inability to put the finishing touches on a, on a good great this is the best core they've had probably since the griffey a rod buner core uh and they've never had a pitching uh, nucleus like this so you've got to you've got to pounce on that and because that's not going to be here very much longer they're going to those guys are going to start hitting arbitration and free agency mm-hmm. uh, it's pretty soon you know this this gilbert kirby uh castillo well he's locked up but miller you know the, these guys that the teams teams covet players like that and to have this you've got to take advantage of it I think a tough one is going to swallow, and I'm, I'm looking way ahead this summer, but a tough one that fans are going to swallow is when they dangle Castillo and, and try to trade him this season. I mean, at the trade deadline, are you talking, or after the season? Yeah, at the deadline. Well, it depends on where they are. If they're out of it, yeah. then, then yeah. they will. If they're, they're, they, they deem themselves not in it. Yeah, that's yeah. gonna and I, and then, and I, I can get their thinking behind it, but people are going to lose their minds. 
thing is they're uh, they, as badly as they've played, they're two games out of first place. I know. You know, if they could take two out of three and then sweep the, the a horrendous Colorado team, that that's one of the there's three just horrible teams in baseball the, the marlins the white Sox, and the rockies the teams need to feast on but then you're suddenly back at 500 and things maybe don't look so bad and you can use that as a jumping off point um so i, I think mean, they're, they they're lucky just... yeah they're lucky to be where they're at right now don't you agree with that oh, i mean yeah. they're they're I, lucky with their record the way they've played they yeah they they picked up some, those early wins against boston and you know one to nothing and, and the uh the other one where they came back late uh, yeah, they played they, they played poorly enough that they should have had a couple more losses in that for sure. Hey, what do you what do you make uh, of Julio as we're talking about this here on a Monday? They just finished up that first game with the Reds. What what do you make of Julio Rodriguez? Bill, Bill Kruger, who all right, I guess this is Tuesday. I think I keep saying Monday uh, as we're recording this on Tuesday. Bill Kruger said something to me interesting on Monday's uh, appearance, which he joins us uh, every Monday at PuckSports.com and. And he's made this comment twice. And and I, I, the first time he said it, like a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, I, I didn't pick up on it until he said it again. But he is under the impression, and he just wondered out loud, if they move too quickly with signing Julio Rodriguez to a, to a massive deal, what do you make of that? Do you think they should have paused on that one and dangled the carrot a little bit longer? Or no, lock him up as fast as you can? No, I don't agree with Bill on that one. I love Bill, but I don't. I don't agree with him on that. Uh, you, he's he's finished top six in the MVP race two years in a row. Let's not overreact to a to a poor stretch here. Uh, the guy's twenty three years old. He's got all the talent in the world. He's just going to get more expensive the longer you wait. Uh, mm. I think locking him up was the was the right thing to do. This guy's going to be the cornerstone of the franchise. Yeah, yeah, he's not perfect. He has uh, he has stretches where he disappears, and he hasn't been great in the clutch. It was that's why it was so good to see that walk off hit he had in the in the second yeah. or third game of the year. But I think he's going to be fine. I think he wants to be great. I don't. If Bill's implying that the contract has made him, uh, you know, not not work as hard or, or care as much. That's just not true. I don't think I've, you know, I watched him last year. I, uh, I think I know enough about what's going on to, to, to know that he's, if anything, he's trying too hard. Uh, you know, he, 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 I thought he was poised for an MVP type season. I think a lot of people did. If you look at preseason predictions, a lot of people picked him for an MVP two weeks in, I'm not going to write that off and say that he's yeah. bust. So. Yeah, that's my feeling. Uh, all right. Yeah, I got you. I, I I do. I agree with you on that one. I just thought it was it was just an interesting take that I hadn't heard before. And I just yeah. was wondering to get your uh, take on it. All right. The um, retirement. What are, what are you up to? Like, what, give me a Larry Stone day. I want to know. I mean, you, you've spent so many years covering clubhouses, locker rooms, sports, uh, NBA. I mean, all of it. You've, you've done all everything sports related. Perhaps you name it. Uh, today you mentioned, you're just like, uh, oh, kind of not paying his, uh, attention as, as much. What does a Larry stone day look like nowadays? Well, uh, usually I get up and I do a, a workout. I'll either okay. run, <laughs> I run, uh, I live up in the Newport Hills and I run the pipeline about four days a week. I used to run, I used to pass Jim Moore running cause he lived in the same area. And then, and then was he uh, drinking while he was running <laughs> or not? He, he was usually bringing, he was, he had a dog on a leash. One of his dogs usually oh, was on wait, a leash. Wait a minute. The, the dog was actually <laughs> on a leash this time, or uh, not I off leash, so. like running in people's yards. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think out of deference to all the other people on the pipeline, but we're, we're the, we're the exact same age, Jim and I, we, uh, uh he's wow, two months you older. Look much better. <laughs> you look much better that. he he's know. falling apart <laughs> but yeah his his knees their legs forced okay. him to stop running fortunately i i can still run so i do that Good. that that takes up an hour or i have an elliptical yeah. machine that i got during the the, the pandemic and days i don't run i do the elliptical so and okay. then i'll just pour over the uh, Twitter and the internet and read the paper and, and that sort of thing <laughs> at leisurely old pace. school paper. Do we have a, do we oh, have a, do we school. have a, oh, we have an old school copy. 
God, Absolutely. I love you. Yeah, I'm with you on love that. You. I've heard you talk about <sighs> that. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on I just, just There's just something. Yeah, there's just something. It's, you know, that, I mean, I know what it is. It's just the ritual of it. I mean, I love the way it feels. I love the ink on my hands. I love, I love the frustration of folding the pages. Yeah, I know <laughs> what you mean. Me yeah, so that makes me so angry. And then, I, and I, and and every day I read it, or most days, I have I have the same thought that comes through my head. Why don't we? I think it's the New York Post that does it. This, does it this way? Why don't we make it more like magazines and and that way? Rather than this, I gotta fold it, and cr I mean, it just drives me nuts. But they, they call they call that it a tabloid. They call that a tabloid, a tabloid. format. And it, yeah, the yeah. New York Post, the, all the Daily News, Newsday, all the papers in New York. Yeah. To, I think that's just for the ease of reading on the subway. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm with you on that one. But <laughs> I'll tell you okay. what. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what I love most about the newspapers at, at this time of year. I tweeted about it the other day. I love the baseball box score page. You know, you can yeah. you you can find all that on the internet, and and but to me, opening to the with with your morning you know cup of coffee and open to the box score page and just pour over every game. Look look who got hits, who pitched well. I love that. I could spend an hour. I do spend an hour doing that every day. It's the I I swear to you, it's almost the only. Well, I, I get the paper for two reasons. <laughs> That's number one because yeah. I. Actually, it's three reasons. Box scores, and I'm with you. I know I can look at them the night before. And I do yeah. look at them the night before. Yeah, same here. But I really like looking at them the next day, and I just like looking at them in the paper. There's just something about on my phone that I, I don't yeah. know. I just don't like. The other reason, they're great poop bags for my dogs. That's why I get it, because I use the, the bag for, uh, for the dogs. And then three, I love. And I know I can read them online. And there's another person that loves this just like me. His name's Mike Gastineau. I love the I know, rant I know and what rave you're section. Say. Yeah, I knew you were going to say I love the rant and rave. There's just nothing better than I love people bitching and moaning about stuff. And it's the stupidest stuff that people complain about. Uh, that's why I love the paper. I, I, don't, I just grew up on it. I mean, it just was ever since I was a kid, you know, and, you know, I'm not to like date you, you and, and Jim and those and anybody I talked to. But I mean, I grew up reading you guys and. It just was like first thing I did before I went to school, read the paper. I'm old enough to remember that when I got home, there was another, and I can't remember, was it the Times in the afternoon or the PI? Yeah, when I got here, the Times was still afternoon. And, That's right. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd get home and, and I would read the, the afternoon newspaper. And I just, I don't know, I love it. And I, I can't give it up. And I'll continue to get it as long as they keep pumping it out. Well, it really warms my heart that I gave my, my heart and soul and shed blood for 27 years so you could use the poop bag. The, the, uh, the... <laughs> it's a great poop bag. What do you want? It's a, it's a great poop bag. The, um, you spent some time uh, down in the Bay Area, right? How many years were you down there covering sports? Down there for 10 years. Well, I went to Cal, so yeah. yeah. And then, uh, then I started in Yakima, but then I went back for 10 years uh Working for in Santa Rosa and San at the and the San Francisco Examiner, Ma majority of the time covering the Giants, correct? Yeah, for first three years I did the A's and Giants, and then I was the Giants traveling beat writer. What do you, what do you make of the A situation? What should Major League Baseball do? I mean, obviously here in Seattle, I, I think we have a personal connection to it because obviously what happened with the Sonics. But for me, all I've known growing up as a kid, now an adult, is is the Oakland A's, and they've always been one of the best franchises. Uh, in Major League Baseball, and so many great players have, have come out of Oakland. I love that city. Uh, um, it breaks my heart to see what's happened with the Raiders and the Warriors and all that. And I know the Warriors just went across the street, but it's the it's a it's a different clientele now. Um, but how did we get here? Why did ba baseball allow this to happen to to such a great franchise? Well, the, the ten years I lived in, in the Bay Area, the entirety I lived in Oakland. Uh, I loved Oakland. I it's. I mean, I, I loved every, every part of living in Oakland and, you know, it, it has a bad rap, but, and, and, you know, it's been 25 years, but I think a lot of people will tell you that Oakland is a, is, is a very vibrant city. They, I was there during the Canseco, McGuire, Carney Lansford, uh, Eck, Stu, glory days. And that town was on fire over the A's. I mean, uh, three straight world series while while i was there um and as exciting a team as you'll ever see and they were they 
they didn't fill the place up, but they were drawing 2 million fans. They were out drawing the Giants for sure for a stretch there. Uh, part of it is the Giants, you know, put down the hammer and wouldn't let them move to uh, San Jose. They claimed that territory, which would have been the perfect place for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know the ins and outs, Puck, of, of what, what happened there. I think they have an owner who is kind of a moron, <laughs> it seems like. He seems yeah, like he's I, I guess I'm just asking more, just more, you know, just broad picture. I, I just think yeah. that it's it's such a, you know, we see it, sports changing so much, right, with college football yeah. and the portal and coaches you leaving and chasing the money and chasing that, that we just can't have, you know, like you and I like the old newspaper. We just can't have the old nice things anymore, it seems like. Everyone's got to go bigger and better and flashier. And that's what I just, you know, the John Fisher and the ownership group is doing. I, I don't think they'll ever play a game in Vegas, by the way. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I, I don't think they're going to build that. I don't think they're going to build that stadium. I bet you they end up in Sacramento. And that's where they, they'll yeah, be. Yeah, that's why, that's why it was so sad when they even they, they named Sacramento as their interim home. Because if they'd stayed in yeah. Oakland and toughed it out there, they might have had a shot at rekindling the uh, right. the the new stadium there if and when. And I agree with you. I don't see it happening in Vegas. Doesn't seem like Vegas wants them very badly. Mm -hmm. They don't have a, a great plan finan to finance the thing. Uh, they've bungled everything else that they've done. This group. So you know, yeah, at least if it's in Sacramento, the diehard Bay Area fans, it's not a it's not a difficult overly difficult drive to get there so they could at least get to see their their team but these next three or four years are going to be miserable <laughs> you know this year oh. playing and it looks like they actually have a decent club that's much better than people thought uh they you know, always some do. good young town <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i don't know what the, here's a question i don't really know the answer is what happened to billy bean it's like he's the invisible man you know he was so synonymous with that yeah. franchise but it's like he's he's uh checked out and he i know he's working on some soccer things yeah yeah, yeah you don't hear his name. yeah 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 for sure you don't hear his name mentioned at all you don't you never see him uh anymore but yeah they've always just kind of been a model franchise i mean i hope things work out for him i, I just feel bad for the ace fans i mean i know we're on the cusp of getting hopefully the nba and the sonics back but it was just it's been miserable with for me personally being a huge uh, nba and basketball fan it's been miserable without him and i just can feel with what Oakland fans are going through. You lose your football team, you lose your basketball team, now you're going to lose your baseball team. And it just, and I agree with you, it's a, it's a great city. All right, let, let's end on a couple of things here. Uh, again, Larry Stone, former columnist, Seattle Times here on the Daily Puck Drop, the DPD, uh, which you can find at pucksports.com. Obviously, you're watching it on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you find uh, your podcast. The, um, it's like asking your favorite kid or your do you have an interview that at least a subject that stands out to you the most over the years being a, a reporter and a journalist? Particular interview? Oh, man. Or, or a subject, maybe. maybe or, or maybe just a subject that you had, you know, multiple times. That if you, well, right now, if they gave you one assignment, you could go back and, and do a profile on that person. You know, the, one of the most fascinating people I ever interviewed was Lester Hayes of the uh, Oakland Raiders. Do you remember? <laughs> you remember Lester Hayes? Of course. I bet you that he, wore all the, he wore all the stick-em. He wore stick the stick-em on his hands. Yeah. But oh, yeah. He was an incredibly interesting guy uh, who he had a unique way of talking, but uh, very colorful. And uh, I just remember doing an interview with him and being mesmerized by uh his 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 uh, what he was saying and and the way he was saying it and uh so you know that even though it was early in my it was when i moved back to the bay area after uh yakima but he he was an incredible guy that people don't really remember much anymore but he was a great player and a, i think a lot of people from that era have lester hayes on their all interview team uh, yeah, he was great. Those matchups with him and Largent when I was a kid were, were awesome. Yeah. Uh, they were the best. Um, I'm going to have to think on that one, Puck. Nothing. Okay. Uh, I, have a, uh, I know I've had a million great interviews, yeah. but uh, um, 
I'm I'm drawing a blank right now. That's happens. Why don't you brag something. more about all your great interviews for Jesus? Jesus, man. I mean, God, I've had a lot of great interviews over the years. I mean, be a little humble for crying well, out loud there, Larry. It wasn't me. It wasn't my interviewing. It was the people <laughs> I got to I got to interview. Uh, Who did you? I remember, was there? I, I go ahead. Well, I got one when the the when Griffey came back to the Mariners. Uh, remember, he'd left Cincinnati yep. and they, he resigned with them whenever that was. Uh, 10, 2009 or 2010, uh, I obtained the phone number. He, he, he said that he got some counsel from Willie Mays. So I, through a friend in the Bay Area, I got Willie Mays' number, which, which ends 2424. And I, I called Willie Mays and talked to him for about 10 minutes about Griffey. And I mean, what a thrill that was. Um, oh. Yeah, just to, to get Willie Mays on the phone, and then okay, now they're coming back to me. When I was in uh, <laughs> when I was in spring training in Vero Beach, I used to, I one of my great the, prop, the most fun I had was my, was spring training, and the Seattle, Seattle Times used to send me to Florida to to go around to the camps there, and not in addition to going to to Arizona. And I was in Vero Beach in Tommy Lasorda's office doing an interview. Uh, and who should walk in but my all-time baseball hero, Sandy Koufax. And he sits down, and Tommy Lasorda goes, he, he remembered my name, which amazed me. He goes, Larry, have you met Sandy Koufax? And I said, no, no, I haven't. Uh, Sandy, meet Larry Stone. He's here from Seattle. So Koufax shook my hand, uh, Was couldn't have been less interested, kind of sat down and waited for us to get done. but. Uh, uh, meeting my and getting to shake hands with my idol Sandy Koufax and Tommy Lasorda's office is an all timer. Yeah, you ever piss anybody off? Something <laughs> <Yeah>. you wrote. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody I, stand out to you? Well, well, yeah. One time, remember the the the, the tie All Star game that ended in a tie in Milwaukee? Yeah. 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 I I wrote I, I ripped MLB pretty hard. And the the two days later, I was back home, and I get a my phone rings. I don't even think I had a cell phone. I think it was my home phone. And my wife says, uh, "There's somebody named Bud Selig is on the phone." So, <laughs> <laughs> the Cubs center of baseball what? is calling you on your home phone. Oh. Bud called me at home. He was, you know, not only was he commissioner, but he was so tied to Milwaukee. He. He, it was a personal embarrassment to him to have this happen in Milwaukee of all yeah. places. And he, he, he was furious at what I'd written about how they bungled that situation. And uh, uh, so he ringed me out for a, for a couple of minutes. <laughs> and, uh, but then he calmed that's down. good stuff. Yeah. And uh, Will Clark once got really mad at me when I covered the giants. Uh, and, but for the most part, you know, you're gonna you're gonna ruffle some feathers, especially when you become a columnist. But uh, I think I was able to, for the most part, to navigate without really uh, getting any death threats or anything from people. Well, Larry, you're the best. I appreciate you, you joining me today on the Daily Puck Drop, the DPD. Uh, thank you for all the kind words. Right back at you. You've been. You know, I've said this to you probably privately before, and I think I've said it publicly. I'm just going to say it again. You you have been so kind uh, to me, and I know to others over the years. I was 23, walking inside a, a clubhouse covering baseball for the very first time. I'd never covered baseball before. I'd covered, you know, the NBA and things like that, and I didn't know really what I was walking into. And uh, people like you were, were just so welcoming. You never, you never big-leagued me. You always uh, you talked to me, and uh, you offered uh, – uh, advice and, and all of that. So for when I was young, it meant the world to me, especially for somebody that, that I had read and, and covered and, and then got to know over the years, uh, both uh, personally and professionally. So thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on today, uh, sharing some stories, and uh, I hopefully we can catch up soon. All right. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Puck, and good luck with this venture. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a big success. I, well, I, well, you know what? My, my family hopes so. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. There he is, Larry Stone on the Daily Puck Drop. Again, we do it every day, uh, 10 a.m. All guests come on at 1 o'clock. Uh, you can find it at Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube. 
Everything also is all there at PuckSports.com, kind of a one-stop shop. Coming up today, our weekly visit with John Canzano. Again, we release those every day at 1 o'clock, so we'll talk to John about all things college uh, sports and anything and everything that comes up there with Canzano. Again, coming up today at 1 o'clock. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. As always, we promise to be better. No shirt, no shoes, no dice. So. Would anybody like to smoke some pot? Yeah. I was born to love you. I was born to lick your face. I was born to rub you. But you were born to rub me first. What do you need my address for? We'd like to send out a mailer. <laughs> Mother of mercy, I don't speak Japanese! <laughs>